find this. Hello everyone, this is Olga Yaroshevsky, I'm the head of the content strategy for NextChange Group, and we're here at Hawkeye Blockchain Week. And um, I'm very happy to be joined today by our uh, decent experts. Um, let's give it up for Dr. Ernie Teo from Singapore. Dr. Ernie is a co-founder of DDoCo and also adjunct senior lecturer on FinTech and Blockchain at the NUS Business School. And by the way, Dr. Arnier, congratulations on your report about digital disruptions in finance, which came out in October, right? Thanks. Yeah, it's very timely for our discussion. Thank you. Um, Mohamed yes. Sir is an associate partner in digital government and public sector advisory for Africa, India, and Middle East at Ernst & Young. Mohamed, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for joining us. Mohamed's focus is on bringing purpose to digital and government. And Mohammed is also a proponent of what he calls a smart state. We'll be coming back to this and we'll listen more about this, as well of the purpose of the digital transformation efforts. Um, Andy Lian, who has been recently appointed as the advisory board member of for the Hyundai DAC, which is the blockchain arm of South Korea's largest car manufacturer. Uh, Andy looks after the governance and compliance aspects of the business. Welcome, Andy. Hey, thanks. I know that you also serve as blockchain advisor for Asian Productivity Count, or uh, sorry, Asian Productivity Organization. It's an intergovernmental organization committed to improving productivity in the region. And um, uh, last but not the least, Dr. To Charm. Welcome, Doctor. We have 30 years in innovation, fintech, AI, big data, digital strategy, leadership, and transformation, all topics that will be covered today. Dr. Charm is an associate professor um, in the Chinese University of Hong Kong Business School. Uh, he's mastering the future of digital leaders and their minds. And Dr. Charm is also the chairman of OpenCert Hub. It's a globally recognized platform to authenticate AI, big data, talents, and open source environment. Welcome, everybody, and thank you again for joining us at Hong Kong Blockchain. So, um, since the topic of our discussion today is digital transformation for governments and businesses, um, I want to take a quick look back because in 2019, many countries took up a direction for digital transformation, such as China, for example, introducing innovation in government and in business. And in 2020, well, the word digital has become even more important with so many people in so many industries having the switch to digital format. And even us now having a discussion online while sitting in different parts of the world, in Singapore, in Dubai, in Moscow, Russia. And this is the very highlight of 2020. And so handy and very convenient, but at the same time, not a good old physical stage. And so back to digital reality. So the transformation efforts um, are very critical amidst the pandemic situation and um, its overall economic impact. However, it's not a very speedy process and it depends strongly on funding, on strategy, on technology development and solutions staying up to date, right? So for example, the recent report says that only 30% of digital transformation projects met or exceeded their target value. And another 44% created some value, but it didn't hit targets and resulted in only limited long-term change. And 26% uh, created value of less than 50%, less than a half of target and produced no sustainable change at all. So is this a problem of a business sector or is this a problem of poor governance or just those technologies are not evolved enough Dr. Ernie, I would like to start with you. Can you elaborate on that? And I'd like to know your economic point of view and also to hear from you as a person inside one of the most rich tech communities in the world, mm -hmm. Singapore. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I think a lot of it, a lot of the lack in the drive for digitization has to do with legacy processes. So um, especially in terms of regulation and compliance, there's a lot of demand to have um, documents in, in paper form, a lot of demand to have like signatures in, in form. 
So those those come from a from legacy regulations that that came down from you know previous um, laws and regulations that came about because there is the entire lack of trust in in these documentation, right? And because of this whole lack of trust. In order to comply with rules and regulations, I demand to see an actual physical copy. I demand to see like the stamp on the piece of paper and a wet ink signature and so on. So uh, I think that's a result of that. And and because um, in a pre-COVID world that is still possible, um, people stuck with it. But even though there's a digital digitization drive by the government, a lot of our risk adverse organizations still take the route of relying on paper documents because they can. Right, but COVID, I think, really changes things and really forces these organizations to re-examine how they um, actually need to drive digitization, right? Because they can't meet customers face to face, they can't meet their clients, they are unable to, you know, pass papers around, and you know, even paper uh, documents may be seen as a transmitter in terms of the virus, right? So, uh, and they want to try to reduce that, and that totally forces them to rethink their own processes and re-examine the risks involved, like, do I really need a paper document in this case? Do I really need someone to sign a, a, a wet ink signature on this item? Right? So that totally forced them to rethink, and, and I think it also has forced them to kind of adopt newer technologies to, in order to keep up with that as well. Right? Because if they don't do so, they will lose business, right? And because they can't do business right now, they can't meet their customers. Right, so that, that's definitely one thing. Um, in Singapore, I think um, the government has done a very good job in, drive, uh, in driving this. Since COVID happened, uh, in, in a lot of the COVID fighting budgets, there are a lot of digitization grants made available to our businesses. Right, so for example, you can claim, um, like if you adopt a accounting software, for example, you can actually claim uh, grants on that and uh, government pay for most of it. Um, there's also, so in the fintech space, um, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, they actually issued a digital acceleration grant to all fintech certified companies. So uh, that means that if you adopt any um, technology in your business and incorporate it in your business, for example, you buy software licenses and uh, you, know, you, you buy security licenses, all that can be again uh, claimed from the government through the Monetary Authority. So there's, there's a lot of drive in that. I think that is fairly interesting. It tries to um, take this opportunity to drive more digitization and to gain more adoption as well. So um, it's quite interesting for us here. And we see that a lot of businesses are now interested in exploring how to digitize their business, their business more and more. Yeah. Interesting. So it's not only you know a government-related solution, but also a business solution and a health solution <laughs> for 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. That's right. Uh, thank you, um, Andy. Now to you. I know that you got recently engaged with this um, Hyundai blockchain program, right? Which is very interesting in terms of tech giants accelerating digital transformation. Can you tell us more about what this blockchain arm does, and uh, about your role in it in particular, and uh, when, and most interestingly, how we will see the results of these efforts? Um, thank you. So, um, well, for the uh, Hyundai DAC, is actually running as a main net. But, you know, without going into too much of uh, technical aspects and the possible future that they are promising, what, what I do see and, and like everyone in the panelists would see is that uh, Hyundai being a big brand, um, they have... Um, you know, businesses across multiple sectors, you know. So for, for them to adopt blockchain and push the blockchain agenda uh, across to their core industry like uh, automotive and so forth, it is already going to be a big thing. You just imagine um, how they do their tracing, uh, traceability, tracking and so forth within their own supply chain, within their own Hyundai group. And that is going to span across multiple regions and multi, multiple countries, you know. So just touch wood, you know, I mean, this is not happening, but, you know, players like uh, Toyota, uh, Lexus, you know, they, they did quite a fair bit of recall uh, recently as well for some of the parts, you know. So if you just imagine if they are also pro-blockchain, uh, pro-technology um, in, that, in that manner, you could then... Is up the whole process of uh, recalling, 
you could also ease up the whole process of avoiding more accidents within um, within their space. So, so looking at what what the main is trying to do uh, in in uh, 2021 and 2022, I think it would be more of adoption within their own uh, family. That's number one. Number two, will they will also look at other um, sectors that that they can uh, they can um, this uh, push towards. You know, I can't speak for 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 the whole group, but I do know that uh, uh, whatever that that we are trying to do would be very much within the supply chain space and uh, fulfilling some gaps that is within this whole supply chain space. Um, another thing interesting to also mention about some of the work that I've done you know, with, the, uh, with different government, um, like South Korea, uh, J Japan, Thailand, and so forth, you know, we, we do see that there's a very strong push from, uh, from, from governments or from association um, trying to push very hard, you know, to make sure that uh, you know the, the the fintech agenda or the technology agenda is being put in place. But I do also see that the, the, there's one big problem, you know, like what uh, uh, Ernie has mentioned. You know, um, I do see that the, the problem is with the human being, not so much with the legacy systems. Um, they have the tendency of looking at things from a more um, from, from a more negative angle, and that is also one very big reason why a lot of such adoption in terms of technology is not pushing through too much, and also the reliance on government grants, especially so, uh, is also a very uh, big uh, uh, disadvantage. You know, based on what I see, you know, especially when we look at things from uh, from a Singapore's perspective, um, the grants, the the, the different uh, technology claims and so forth uh, has been running around uh, perhaps for the last decade or so. Um, but are, are all the companies really into the innovation? Are they really, really you know, really enough to, to, to innovate and, and put, put themselves through this uh, whole, whole technology drive, drive way? I, I don't think so. You know, many of these projects stop after one year. You know, after they made their claims through, the project just stopped. You know, I see. I see. Dr. Chum is uh, also nodding his head. But you know, we, we do see that happening every every now and then. You know, so um, my my point is, this, you know, in order for innovation to grow, um, it has to be win-win for everybody, for the company, right mindset, and also with a small push from the government. You know, not not hand holding them too much, but giving them a, a good push. That that would be how innovation is 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 going to kick start. Dr. Charm, do you have do you have something to add here? Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with Andy. Uh, government subsidies, I think, is helpful, but it cannot be sustainable. Right? So uh, uh, what I see is the most successful digital transformation is we can see the, a real cultural change in the company. Whether it's big company or SME, if you cannot change the culture, that means they can really appreciate the value of digital transformation to different functions and business uh, of the company. Then it's hard to sustain. Right? I think this COVID-19 is good. It's definitely in terms of uh, increasing the um, digital adoption in Singapore, in Hong Kong, I think the same. And uh, government is putting some additional subsi uh, subsidies to different SMEs and you know all different kinds of programs, <clears throat> but it's only for a short period of time. It cannot be sustained. So I think that's definitely with the culture. I think is one thing, but I would like to add one more point. Uh, you have we have to make it closer to uh, what the companies are doing. So I learned from uh, Singapore uh, DBS. Uh, there's a famous uh, face from um, Mr. Gupta which is the CEO of uh, DBS, uh, he said about bank less and live more, right? Uh, this is a very good one for every one of us in the fintech industry to think about this. That means, would that mean bank is going to be disappear or there's something else? Well, uh, DBS is still a bank, right? I don't think Mr. Gupta want DBS, uh, you know, disappear in a short period of time, right? So, so what I think is, 
can we help the SMB and also the large company think about how you can actually embed technologies into your customer life? In your customer journey, don't, they don't feel about blockchain. They don't feel about fintech, but they're actually using, right? So if we can do that, then the adoption and sustainability probably can hang on. So, so, so what I see is I, I got inspired by Mr. Gupta anyway, but I think that is something to do. But in terms of technology right now, I, I think uh, many cities, including Singapore and Hong Kong right now are pushing for the open API. And the open API is helping the FinTech and the bank talk to each other. But further on, it can also talk to different types of apps and tech companies, right? So if we can do that, we are getting closer to what we call embedded or even immersed technology in our daily life and daily work, including blockchain. So, so I, I hope in the next three to five years, we can actually uh, make it happen in that sort of uh, direction. Thank you. That's interesting. Um, yeah. I love how the discussion uh, quickly went from, you know, the digital government to user experience and to actual user problems. And um, by the way, speaking of um, new technologies, Dr. Sharp, so you've been, you cover a lot of different tech, right? And you were also engaged with the startup ecosystem. So which technologies are now in the most demand since the beginning of 2020 for business or for customer, for user experience? And how do they apply? Any, any interesting and outstanding examples over the last two or three years? Uh, no doubt about it, it's definitely AI and big data. Yeah, and, and it's not yet blockchain. It's not, blockchain is still a, a distance from you know the mass market, right? But in terms of the mass market, actually everyone is using AI and big data. Right? The divide of using AI or not using AI is getting becoming bigger and bigger. So, so even SME, they're doing advertising. They don't know they're using programmatic advertising yet, right? So, so. That's so very important for SME and also big company, how they can adopt and make use of AI and big data faster than their competitors. Yeah, we, we talk about a lot of business model actually driven by the data. Uh, we're talking about platform. We're talking about all these um, alternative financing, uh, you know, or everything, including P2P lending. It's everything about big data. And we're talking about checkboard, we're talking about AI. So I think this is the immediate solution for many, many problems that we have in the market. So definitely AI and big data will be the, the priority for, you know, for, for the banks, for all the incumbents uh, to really adopt it and then make use of it. Otherwise, they will fall far behind. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. AI and big data is, is definitely tomorrow. So um, I would now like to zoom out a little and uh, give the floor to Mohammed um, to tell everyone about your smart state concept. And this is very interesting to me, mostly in some kind of a you know philosophical way. And uh, dear panelists, please feel free to ask Mohammed questions after uh, he finishes. Hey, thank you. Uh, so before going into smart state, let me set the context to why I feel that we are living in a time when we need to be thinking differently. Uh, I think Andy and also Ernie and even Dr. Sharm, I think, mentioned a little bit about the need for reimagining. And why am I saying that? If you think about where we are today um, or where we were before, most of us were doing our activities in a silo way in many different uh, touch points or different uh, channels. Today, whether it's shopping, playing, working, living, educating, all has basically collided into this one device. You know, we, we now have this as our life. So what does that mean in, in reality? We have gone, or in practicality, we have gone over a very short period of time from a, a life which was in the physical form, most of our activities were in the physical form, to transition towards the online or digital world. 
So there are two different worlds we are living in today. You know, we operate in the physical world and also in the in the online world. The second factor, if we think about when the operating model for countries was developed or, or we came up with the, the concept of how we should run a country, that dates back to many hundreds of years when the main ingredient into running of the affairs of a state were people. We, you know, we had very little technology, uh, let alone ICT. I mean, ICT is a revelation of the last uh, uh, maybe, you know, a couple of decades. You know, it, okay, it's been there since the 60s and 70s, but in its, in its uh, exponential form, it really happened in the last uh, uh, couple of decades. So when everything around us has, has changed so much and is changing even further. So if we look at now, what are people predicting and number of studies you can see 1.2 billion um, 5G connected devices by 2021. We are looking at each one of us having 15 connected devices per person by 2030. Significant change. You know, right now we're just talking about a mobile phone, but we're talking about even device-to-device -device connectivity and not just, uh, not just what we are using for communication purposes. And we are talking about something like 41.6 billion connected devices by 2025. This is a totally different world to where we are living in today and where it's going. So, so the question I ask myself and I'm asking everyone else, does this mean that we should stay in the way we are operating and approach things in the way? Most of our actions on embracing digital technologies being what I call of a uh, practical and fundamental nature. We have not questioned the operating model in many cases and or, or why we really need to do what we do today. So all this has been going on in my mind for some time. I've been working in government for, for uh, a number of years before that I was. I started my career within the UK government, so I had hands-on experience of being a government employee and working from that perspective, transitioned into the industry and then into consulting. So all of this and what I'm seeing over the last few years, and the, that really we are living in a different era to where we were before. So we really need to reimagine the the state, not just the government. Most people are looking at digital from a government lens perspective. And did, government is one pillar typically of running a state, the other two pillars being, you know, the legislature and also judiciary. But in the world we're living today, which has shifted so much, should we also be looking to add maybe another two pillars to how we run the state because of how the world has changed. And one of those pillars is media. We often talk about media being the fourth pillar, but why not make that a, um, a defined pillar of running of a state? And the fifth one, which I believe now has become more relevant than it ever was before, is citizens. The reason why we have the models of working that we have today is because we have a representative model of running a state. The reason, in essence, there could be multiple, but in essence, was that it was not practical for one million, two million, or three million people to run the day-to-day -day affairs of a state. So you selected your representatives to run and manage a state on behalf of the majority. So that was a practical reason. But today, with the shift in technology, where I can actually be connected with my or representative on a day-to-day -day basis, algorithms uh, can use can be used to machine learning or, or AI can be used to keep me connected. And for those most important things, for my uh, for my uh, myself as an individual, I want to raise up to my member of parliament who can go and or my representative who can go up and make this a pro priority or find fight for that for my particular area where I live in. Is possible today. So I believe that we are at a very defining moment in history where everything has shifted so much towards 
technology becoming the bedrock of everything we do. So it gives us an opportunity to really rethink the operating model for a country. And I feel um, those I mentioned that having something like a smart a government, smart legislator, smart the principles of basically looking at governments having their focus being what I call life, sense of life experiences, and their core built around this data and data has become the fundamental building block for governments of the future. The model that they operate is being ecosystem based. So not wanting to do everything themselves, but becoming more of a facilitator, more of an enabler, and then leveraging the ecosystem to really make it possible for everything to happen and being more citizen focused. But from this perspective, being very much uh, digital first, because we know that technology is now becoming our first choice for communicating online digital is becoming that for all citizens and users of uh, government services and even private sector but having the obsession with outcomes so not about producing uh, things for the sake of producing but being driven with clear outcomes clear purpose and using technology to, to, to drive that so that's in essence Concept of the idea. Um, it's a conceptual stage. Obviously, there's a lot to think about, a lot to do, and it's not saying that governments around the world are not, or countries around the world are not doing embracing some of these. You see many countries where they are using participatory model of running, um, doing budgetary processes or problem solving, getting citizens much more involved and businesses much more involved. And you see some examples uh, even in, in the UAE, in Dubai, we see some very interesting examples of how they are, they are starting to build a smart state. So when you put it all together, you are coming up with a different way of um, moving forward as a whole uh, country. I'll pause there. And I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I'm sorry, Maybe let me, I wasn't uh, mute. Sorry. Yeah, go on, Andy. Yeah, let, let me let, let me just uh, share a bit of views and so forth. But I, I think I think um, you know men, men, many many people who know me, you know, sometimes I'm a very idealistic guy, you know, futurist and so forth. You know, I do I do understand where uh, Muhammad is coming from. You know, from a more uh, idealistic state of, uh, of of what what he's trying to envision. You know, but but the fact is. Um, you know, there are, there are people right now who are creating states that is run by codes, run by algorithms and so forth. Um, and the question that I always have is, are we ready, very ready for such kind of uh, a government that is run by just pure codes? You know, because whenever there are human in intervention, whether you are doing the coding or not doing the coding or let's be like what Dr. Chum has mentioned, you know, things are, uh, you know, through machine learning, through AI and all those things. But fundamentally, if it's still going to be uh, governed or started by a, 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 a human being, then there will be some sort of flaws and some sort of flaw, fraud within the whole system. And, and again, the other question that, that we look at will be, you know, giving that kind of rights, giving that kind of uh, responsibility to a small consensus of people or big consensus of people, will the government or the current government be ready to adopt such a such a such a, such a, such a, of a big change? And then there are also thoughts of um, who is going to be responsible. You know, so in, in today's world, you know, where we talk about blockchain, cryptocurrency. Um, we, we are talking a fair bit about uh, our future, you know, how the whole future is going to be like, how the crypto exchanges are going to be like, how the finance system is going to be like. But what we see right now are things that we could do a lot better in future, but not now because, just example, you know, if today you are running a centralized exchange, you know, like, uh, like the Binance uh, or, or like the OKEX and so forth, you know, whenever there are problems, you know, users, whenever there are, there are problems, they can definitely go back to them because they are the central core responsible body to do that. But then 
if you, if you step back, you know, you look at a fully decentralized model where everything is just through P2P, through the different codes and so forth, when your money is lost or when there's a scam, who's going to be responsible for this? So right now, at this current moment, when we talk about government and uh, compliance, we talk about legal issues and so forth, we are not ready. You know, we, we are in a framework right now in 2020, handling all sorts of, um, uh, you know, impacts from the COVID-19. And during this period of time, of course, the whole digital, digital process has uh, moved on significantly faster because uh, SMEs or even the bigger corporations, you know, they are trying to, you know, trying to start e-commerce. You know, for all the longest time, they don't have an e-commerce platform, you know, to, to serve their food or to do their any form of takeaway. So what they did was they just launched the, the, the website and then that is that that is so backwards, you know. When we talk about uh, you know chain hotel, you know, in Singapore doing that, so I I, I do see that there is uh, some gaps between uh, being practical and being I, I, ideal, and of course I would love to be you know in in the more ideal world where we could definitely do what we want and um, and and change some of the things that we do not want to see. So let's let's um let's let's keep going, man. Yeah, and, and just to clarify something very important, um, I'm not advocating about a everything becomes tech, technology driven. What, uh, in fact, in the earlier discussion, um, one of the thoughts that occurred to me when you're having, and you, I think, uh, asked the question about why are there so many projects, digital projects that are not, they either failing or not delivering their their core benefit. And one of the reasons is I, I think we are solving for the wrong problem. We, we, we are technology led in most cases, or what I call technology first. What I'm advocating is we become purpose led or experience led first. Then we look at say, okay, how do we now use technology to achieve something? So often the problem we are solving for is a business model problem or an operating model problem, not a technology problem. But because we go technology first, in many cases, we lose the benefit, true benefit of technology. So what I'm advocating is that in looking to shift the operating model of how we run ourselves, it's more about how do we use technology for the benefit of our people? How can we get our state to become citizen experience led? And one of the, the things I always, it fascinates me that Governments are set up, in essence, to serve citizens. Yet there is nobody across government, or there's no entity that I know of, that is cross-government managing the experience of its citizens. From a pure experience perspective, and saying, we're going to understand our citizens, we are continually going to gather data and enrich our understanding of citizens' needs, and we are going to continue to look at how do we evolve government services or even private sector drive policy making. It's all very siloed or um, sporadic. It's um, dispersed. It's not in a structured way. Everyone is attempting to do experience in the way they think experience is, is right. So I 100% concur and agree with you, Andy, that it's not about technology. It's about being smart. And that's why I chose the word smart, actually, um, not digital. And, one of the one of the things I'm trying to advocate is we stop talking about digital government because why are we using a technology term to describe a government? If you start using either smart state or smart government, at least you're driving the message, which is about being smart. Being smart means that I am going to be uh, intelligent. You know, I am going to be able to understand the needs and wants of expectations of people, and I'm going to create actions that will actually meet those needs, you know, rather than I'm going to just create digital products because I'm a digital government, you know. So just to clarify, and absolutely agree 100%. Yeah, I, I would like to compliment on what Andy and uh, Mohammed talked about. I think I look at the, uh, the email from Mohammed. Uh, you talk about the citizens' uh, ex experience. I think this is pretty good. I don't like the word smart, actually. Smart is too weak and uh, it's relative term 
So <clears throat> what what does it, what do we mean smart, right? Smart for citizens or for customer. That means we wear their shoes, and how we can solve their problem, how we can make it easier for them to live, for them to work, for them to play. So it's I think we need to have a better definition of smart. No matter we talk about smart citizen or smart government or whatever. So I like what you just point out is the uh, citizen uh, experience. So in the commercial world, it's the customer experience. So so I think Singapore is doing a, a pretty good job. I just learned from our Hong Kong Design Center. I talked to the CEO of the Hong Kong Design Center a few days ago. Singapore government actually make design thinking as a strategic priority for the company. So what the point I want to bring out is uh, we cannot just teach technologies. We cannot just use technologies. We also need to educate businessmen or citizens of government how important design thinking is. So we need to make the crossover even tighter. So that's why I talked to the Hong Kong Design Center CEO is trying to cross over digital and also design thinking together. So when we are creating some technologies, making use of technologies, can we also at the same time put them in the eco position at least to think about how we can make our customer better, how we can make our citizen better from the design thinking point of view. Because I have seen so many startups, they are so good in terms of technologies or even they're so good in terms of making money, but not necessarily they are very good in terms of design thinking. So, so I, I think it's time for us to bring back design. Design is not only for fashion. Design is not only for furniture. Right? Design is also can help us to be customer centric and citizen centric. So if we can bring these two things crossover together, so all our startups, all our technologists, maybe can uh, make the real thing happen. So what we call smart become more customer driven or citizen driven. So so that's what I see. I'm, try I'm trying to do it to bring this two world together. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Chong, for your comment. Yeah. Well, all in all, I think it's, it's not about digi digitization or even tokenization for the sake of it, right? Before um, for improving our lives and our uh, customer, user, citizen experiences, and uh, to, for educating everybody on something that is going to happen tomorrow and not happened yesterday, <laughs> right, Andy? Okay, um, I hate to stop this discussion. This is very fruitful and very interesting and very educational again. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts. And um, I'll see you soon. Please enjoy the rest of uh, Hong Kong Blockchain Week. And um, I hope um, to see you not in digital format, <laughs> but physically very soon. And um, thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you.